Good morning, uh, welcome to Church at Home. Uh, my name is Simon Clegg and I'm the pastor of St Barnabas Bible Church here in Cape Town, South Africa. If you're with us for the first time, we're delighted that you're joining us and I hope by the grace of God that our Bible talk today will be a blessing and an encouragement to you even as you continue in fellowship with a local church. We're currently in a series in the Gospel of Mark, which is the eyewitness testimony of the Apostle Peter to the life and work of Jesus Christ. And uh, if our talk today leaves you with questions, we'd be delighted to help you with that. Can I invite you to visit our website, www.sbbc.org.za, and on the home page there's a contact tab where you can leave your details and someone on the team will get back to you in the course of the week. So now as we begin, can I invite you please to open your Bible to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, and I'm going to be reading from verse 7 through to verse 19. Uh, Mark 3, beginning at verse 7. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him, from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him, for he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Well, just so far, and uh, let's ask for the Lord's help as we come to his word together. The psalmist says, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our, to our path. And we do pray, Father, that you would shine that light brightly into our lives this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, one of the reasons that we're taking this journey through the Gospel of Mark is that Mark was writing to encourage Christians who were living in very stressful times. And uh, while the specifics of our situation in Cape Town today might be different, and surely they are, nevertheless, we are just as much in need of that encouragement as they were then. Now, there's plenty to encourage us in the two paragraphs we're looking at together this morning. Uh, that uh, may not have struck you as we were reading them. They may not have seemed to, to you to be very special. But I do hope that in the next few minutes you'll see that they are very wonderful and very important. The first paragraph uh, from verse 7 to 12 shows us a crowd which is fairly chaotic. The second paragraph uh, in verses 13 to 19 shows Jesus choosing 12 apostles. And uh, if you want to know what the point of the sermon is, just in case your concentration begins to wander, I'll give it to you in four words. It is, Jesus makes new people. Now, what we've seen in Mark's Gospel over the last few weeks is that Jesus the King has come into his world and he brings great kindness and great power. <clears throat> but he also experiences great opposition. Uh, last week, we saw that as he taught about the Sabbath, which is a gift from God to enable his people to rest, the religious leaders became so angry that they planned to kill him. Now, the two paragraphs in front of us this morning are rather like two snapshots. 
The first is a picture of massive need in the world. The other is a picture of Jesus calmly choosing 12 apostles, or we might say 12 representatives. And just before we come to the text, uh, I want to remind you that if you have a biblical view of what's wrong with the world today, which all of us desperately need in order to make sense of what we see on the news, then the biblical diagnosis is in Genesis chapter 3, where we see that people have turned their back on God and are living disobedient lives. So Dr. J.I. Packer's famous de definition of sin, uh, of what is really wrong with the world, is people playing God. That's what's really wrong with the world, people playing God. And if you want to know what the solution is, well, you might well turn to a passage like Mark chapter 3 that we're looking at this morning, where we find Jesus making new people. So when people say to us, as they sometimes do, look, you're a believer, the world's in a terrible mess, tell me, what is God doing? One of the possible answers to that question is, well, God is making new people. And when he makes new people, they form a new community. And when they form a new community, they make a positive impact on the world and they look forward to the new creation. And without that piece of information, uh, there's nothing to say about the world that we see today that is both realistic and hopeful. Uh, William Shatner was the actor who famously played Captain Kirk in the television series Star Trek. Uh, he's nearly 90 years old now, and uh, in a recent interview he said this, I see the end of my life approaching and I'm in despair and anxiety and bewilderment that it should go so quickly. And the key to living, I've decided, is denial. Uh, I'm not going to die. Everything's fine. Everything is laughable, a cosmic joke. So laugh. Why should I spend my life weeping? Well, I suppose that is one way of coping, uh, but it's hardly realistic. And there must be a better way than that. And of course there is, as we see in our passage today. So let's look at verses 7 to 12 under the heading Jesus and Crowds, and uh, the second section, verses 13 to 19, under the heading Jesus and the Twelve. So firstly then, Jesus and Crowds. Uh, look with me please at verse 7, which says Jesus withdrew. In other words, Jesus left, he walked out. He's got five disciples with him, uh, James, John, Simon, Andrew and Matthew. Why does Jesus leave? Well, the answer is in the previous verse, verse 6, which says that the interest in Jesus being shown by the religious hierarchy is negative. So one writer says, that Jesus does a deliberate act of separation. He's not retreating, important to say that. He's not nervous, he's not frightened. He's going to walk into Jerusalem many more times after this. But this, I think, is a very powerful demonstration that those who are rejecting his grace will pretty soon find there is no more grace around to reject. Uh, do you remember that time when Jesus sent his disciples out on door-to-door -door ministry, and he said to them, if you go to someone's house and they don't want to have anything to do with you, then just walk away. And if it's a violent refusal, then wipe the dust off your feet as a public demonstration to them. Well, uh, here Jesus is walking away because he's under no obligation to bless people who harden their hearts. And friends, that is absolutely true of entire nations if they turn their back on Christ. When a nation turns its back on Christ, there is no obligation on Almighty God to bless them. The same is true of churches. If a church turns its back on Christ, and sadly some do, there is no obligation on Christ to bless that church. And of course it's true for individuals. 
if you turn your back on Christ, there is no obligation on God to bless you. You see, this, this human rejection, this human arrogance, leads only to spiritual darkness. And can I say that when unbelief takes over in someone's life, it's not normally a sudden thing. It's very rare that someone is very committed one day and totally uncommitted the next. It's usually a process, rather like weeds taking over in the garden. So Jesus is not retreating here to look after himself. He's actually advancing to where people are more receptive. And clearly there were plenty of them. Notice this, in verse 7, it's a large crowd. In verse 8, it's many people. And I think given the size of the feeding miracle we're going to see in chapter 6, I think it's quite possible that the crowds may here have been tens of thousands of people. Now, who are these people who are coming to Jesus? Well, the places that are mentioned in verse 8 are telling us that they've come from all four points of the compass. Some of them have travelled vast distances. Uh, so, for example, Idumea in verse 8 is 120 miles south of Galilee. Uh, and they're not from the religious establishment. They're mainly Gentiles, and they're coming because Isaiah said in chapter 49 of his book that when the light of the world comes, Gentiles will be drawn in. And in contrast to the enemies of Jesus, who refuse his ministry and slink away plotting how to kill him, these people hear what Jesus has been doing. Notice they haven't seen miracles. They've just heard, and they come to him because they trust him. Uh, well, of course, you wouldn't walk, walk 120 miles otherwise. Now, we also have to say that uh, this crowd that comes to Jesus is not an easy crowd. This is not like a Billy Graham crusade where people would sit quietly and politely on the grass. The verses here indicate that the crowd was chaotic. It was an unruly mob. So this is not Jesus being a success with everybody sitting quietly at his feet and listening. These are problem people. Now, I don't know if you ever had one of those children's Bibles where there's a picture of Jesus in a white robe and uh, there's a little child sitting quietly on one knee and a little lamb uh, walking quietly past him and somebody's holding a white lily and it all looks very dreamy. Well, this is the exact opposite. In verse 9, Jesus has to arrange for an emergency boat because the crowds are quite literally crushing him. So what Jesus is facing here in verses 7 to 12 is a kind of media frenzy where Jesus is the celebrity and there are no police. I don't think that the English translation we have conveys just how serious this was. But in the original language, the crowds are squeezing Jesus. They're crushing him. Uh, the sick, believe it or not, are actually falling on him. It's as if they're saying, how on earth am I going to get his attention? Oh, I know, I'll fall on him. And the demon-possessed are falling down in front of him and yelling. So any possibility of Jesus being able to teach and be heard is out of the question. So try and picture this in your mind. I think, humanly speaking, it would be terrifying. Uh, if you're not the Son of God, with supreme power and great love for people, this would be an overwhelmingly terrifying situation. And I think that Mark is showing us this, not just because he wants us to see that the needs of the world are massive, uh, yes, there are thousands and thousands of people in desperate need. Uh, I suppose the picture is rather like a massive high care ward landing at once on Jesus. And he's the only doctor. He's the only solution. But I think the point is that even if Jesus could fix each one, which he could, it's not actually what he's come to do. He's not come to turn that little patch of land into heaven and then go down the road and turn the next little patch of land into heaven. He's not come to do that. He's come to announce the kingdom. 
So if you can imagine the world as a pirate ship and Jesus is on his own ship and he comes alongside the pirate ship and lowers the gangplank from his ship onto theirs, what is Jesus saying to the people on the pirate ship? He's saying, I'm giving you a certain amount of time to change sides. And if you will come over onto my ship, you'll be under my authority, you'll receive a king's pardon, and I'll make you a brand new person. But what Jesus does not say is, OK, I'm going to come across the gangplank onto your ship, bandage up everybody on that ship, and then leave them there. He doesn't do that. Jesus has not come to do a superficial patch-up job on people. He's going to show people that he's the king of the kingdom. He's the person who's eventually going to solve all the problems, but he's going to do that by going to the cross at Calvary. Uh, and you'll notice uh, in chapter 3, verse 11, that the evil spirits know who he is, and they get his identity right. But Jesus' method, you see, is to accomplish his mission by going to the cross and dying there to pay for sin and give us fellowship with God and eternal life in heaven. But did you see that the evil spirits don't mention the cross? Well, of course they don't, because, of course, that's where they're going to be defeated. So they will say quite openly, you are the son of God, but that's all. And in verse 12, Jesus has to shut them up. So notice the contrast. The evil spirits know who Jesus is, but the religious establishment, the Pharisees, they don't know who Jesus is, just like many people today don't know who Jesus is. But the evil spirits do know. And a very interesting this, that there are three times in Mark's Gospel where people identify Jesus as the Son of God. One of them is God the Father in chapter 1. And uh, you remember at the baptism, uh, the voice from heaven says of Jesus, this is my Son. And God the Father goes on to say, in whom I am well pleased. And in that passage, we saw that this is a quotation from the Old Testament that connects the Son of God with his death. Then there is another reference right at the end of the Gospel, where the centurion, standing near the cross, calls out, this man is the Son of God. And of course, there he is, actually watching Jesus die when he says it. And in between, there are these evil spirits calling out, you are the Son of God, but they won't refer to the cross. So they're just saying very unhelpful, in fact, very inflammatory things. Because as soon as people hear about the Son of God, they're immediately going to wonder, what is he going to do? Is he perhaps going to deliver Israel from Rome? People could get very excited about that. But he's not going to do that. He's going to deliver sinners from death on the cross. But the evil spirits won't say that. One of the places where the coronavirus is spreading at an alarming rate in the world at the moment is South America. And uh, one of the news reports on television uh, took the camera from house to house in one of the poorer suburbs to see how people are coping. Being a largely Catholic country, there was often a cross on the wall of these houses and the cameras picked it up. But you see, in Catholicism, Jesus is still on the cross. He's still hanging there. And the news report showed that quite clearly. But of course, friends, there is no hope in that. The Christian hope is that Jesus died on the cross to deliver us from sin and death. And the proof that he's achieved that wonderful victory is that God has raised him from death in the power of an endless life. He's not on the cross anymore. But you see, the sadness and the madness of our world today is that people aren't looking for that. They want immediate solutions for their immediate problems. So they have a very hard time indeed accepting the simplicity of what Christ has come to do, which is to live and die. So that is our first section this morning, Jesus and the crowds. The second section is Jesus and the Twelve in verses 13 to 19. 
And again, these are deceptively wonderful verses. Because at first sight, I suppose it just looks like a list of names. But the words in these verses are highly significant. So in verse 13, we read, Jesus went up on a mountainside. Now, who has done that before? Was it not on a mountain where God appointed the 12 tribes of Israel to be his people in the world? And here is Jesus going up a mountain and he's choosing a new Israel. And that's why the number 12 is so significant. Jesus is quite deliberately and significantly overruling 2,000 years of Jewish history. He's saying, you know how there used to be 12 tribes representing God in the world? Well, now there are going to be 12 men, and here they are. And I want to think with you for just a few minutes about these 12 men. First, these 12 men are not very significant in themselves. Uh, the New Testament does not tell us how wonderful they were. In fact, it tells us a lot of their mistakes. The New Testament doesn't spend time praising these men or even following them. Uh, some of them are almost unknown to us. We don't know where they went and we don't know what they did. The second thing about the Twelve, however, is that they are still greatly remembered and greatly loved. Uh, in his commentary on these verses, Bishop Ryle says this, The names of a few Jewish fishermen are known and loved all over the globe, while the names of kings and rich men are lost and forgotten. By the way, the list of apostles appears in four places in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke and Acts, and there's only one difference between them. <clears throat> so in the Matthew Mark list, there's somebody called Thaddeus, and in the Luke Acts list, there's someone called Jude. Uh, like many of, the, uh, many of the disciples, in fact, had two names, uh, Simon Peter, for example, Matthew Levi. It's quite possible that Thaddeus and Jude are therefore the same person. The third thing to say about these people is that they are so very different. Uh, I can't imagine what it was like trying to get these men to work as a team, because Matthew is pro-Rome, uh, Simon the Zealot is anti-Rome, some of the disciples are fishermen, uh, some of them, like Levi, are businessmen, and there's a whole range of personalities and different backgrounds. Uh, the first few days together must have been very strange indeed. But you see, under the leadership of Jesus, they all have him in common, which means that they have more in common than they don't have in common. And in just the same way, when you become a Christian, you have more in common with another believer than you have in common with your best unbelieving friend or family member. As soon as you come to Christ, you have immeasurable things in common with other Christians. And that's the way we need to live. I mean, just think for a moment with me about that little church in Philippi. It started with Lydia, who was a wealthy businesswoman. Uh, she was soon joined by a slave girl who'd been rescued from a life of satanic control. And these two were then joined by a Roman jailer. Now that was the threesome that God used to start the church at Philippi. I can't imagine a more unlikely team than that. Humanly speaking, they had nothing in common, but in Christ, they had everything in common. Now, fourthly, the most remarkable thing about these 12 men is that the word appointed, uh, which appears in verse 14 and again in verse 16, is actually the word made in the original. Now, I got quite a surprise when I discovered this because the text of verse 14 actually says Jesus made 12. Now, that is the same word that we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, which says that God made the world. And here, Jesus made 12. 
He didn't just give them a new job and say, uh, see if you can be helpful. He gave these men a new soul, a new heart, and a new life. That, of course, is what Jesus did for Levi when Levi got up from the tax collector's booth. Uh, Levi would never in a million years have left a profitable business like that without Jesus. But you see, Jesus made him into a new person. And that's what happens today when people hear the Bible being taught and they want to understand it. Jesus makes you into a new person. Of course, if a person doesn't really want to understand the Bible and thinks they're perfectly fine on their own, well, no amount of Bible teaching will make the slightest difference. But here, when we read that Jesus made the Twelve, we're being reminded that God transforms people. He doesn't do a superficial patch-up job. He does a profound transformation. And notice, will you, that Jesus names some of them or renames them, just as in Genesis God did a naming process. And then the fifth thing to say is that these men are going to be part of the solution. Uh, so the contrast is this. In chapter 3, verse 10, there is a frenzied crowd. But the men in verses 14 and 15 move out to preach the gospel that changes people. And they're given power to cast out demons, which would restrain the tide of evil at that time. Now, yes, of course, it's true. Judas was unchanged. He was the tragic member and betrayer amongst the twelve. He had all the privileges, he had all the opportunities, but he became the betrayer. He did it freely. He wasn't a, a robot. No one made him do it. No, he wanted money and he was glad to take the money and betray Jesus. But in doing that, of course, he fulfilled terrible predictions in the Old Testament. The sixth thing to say is that the top priority for the disciples is to be with Jesus, verse 14. Now that, of course, is the key to discipleship, to be with Jesus, to walk with him, to listen to him. And uh, these men were also to be eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and ministry, so they re could record for later generations everything Jesus said and did. How thankful, therefore, we are for these eyewitnesses who went everywhere with Jesus and recorded everything he said and did and could say, like John, we were there, we saw him, or like the Apostle Peter, yes, we were with him on the mountain. They saw, they heard. And then the seventh thing in verse 14 is that they were sent out. In the Old Testament, God's people were gathered in the Promised Land. In the New Testament, God's people are first gathered to Jesus, and then they're sent out with the Gospel. So these two paragraphs are very striking pictures of reality. The first is a picture of problems, problems, problems pressing in. And the second paragraph is a picture of brand new people going out. So as, uh, as I read this, I'm reminded about the man in Mark chapter 5 who's demon-possessed. And he's a real drain on the community. But he meets Jesus, and Jesus changes him, and that man then becomes a fountain of blessing in his community. So he's transformed, isn't he, from being a drain into being a fountain. And how often we see this in the world. Uh, how often we see somebody who starts out on the pirate ship, but they cross over to Christ, and then they're wonderfully used in the world. Now, I want to finish this morning with some things for us to take away from the passage. Uh, and I want to start by saying to those of you who might be listening for the first time that I do hope that you will receive and not reject the, the life that Christ died to give you. He died 
to take the judgment of God on your behalf and he offers you eternal life as a free gift that has got nothing whatever to do with your good deeds or the lack of them. Now, recently I came across the obituary of a lady called Anne Naismith. Uh, as a young woman she'd been a concert pianist who taught music at uh, Trinity College in London. Uh, the obituary described her as charming, dignified, cultured and kind. But at some point her life unravelled and she spent the last 26 years of her life living in her car, which was a Ford console. And as I was reading that, I was wondering, well, why didn't somebody help her? And the answer is that she would accept no charity of any kind from anybody. Now, we don't know why that was the case. So maybe it was her pride. But if a person says, I'm accepting no charity from Christ, I've got my pride, that will be fatal because it's holding out the empty, humble hands and receiving what Christ gives, which brings the brand new life that will last forever. And then secondly, be careful to follow Christ's agenda. Uh, don't make the mistake of trying to impose your own agenda on him. In Jesus' day, the, the crowds had plenty of ideas about what Christ ought to be doing. And critics today have plenty of ideas about what the church ought to be doing. But Jesus, you see, is not interested in bandaging the world. Jesus is interested in gospeling the world because that brings the transformation we all need. See, our need is not that God would love us because we have a fantastic track record. Our need is that we would take our bad track record, which all of us have, and that we would take it to Jesus to find forgiveness and new life. Do concentrate also on the 21st century privilege of going with Christ and going out for Christ. Um, of course, we can't do that physically in the way that the apostles did, but we are able to walk with him in real fellowship, reading his word and praying to him. And we're also able to go out for him, being, as it were, salt and light and a city on a hill. And I do hope you'll do that. Can I also say don't wait for perfect circumstances before you start doing that. Don't say to yourself, well, I'm going to be really keen once God has changed my immediate circumstances. Just say, uh, is it a new day? Has God made me a new person? Is he able to use to be available? And I want to use the resources I have in his service. And lastly, I do hope you'll keep this wonderful truth in your mind so that when you're faced with the question, what is God doing in the world today? That you'll remember that the answer is he's making new people and uh, it's new people who come into a new community who affect the world in a positive way and who are waiting and looking forward to the new creation. And when somebody asks you that question, what is God doing? And you say he's making new people, don't forget to say, are you a new person? Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that in spite of the great troubles in our world, that you've made it possible for anyone to have a fresh start with Jesus because he's borne the penalty for our sin on the cross. Father, if anyone listening this morning knows they need that fresh start, please help them to come to Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, that he might make them into a brand new person, having the sure and certain hope of eternal life. And we ask it for Christ's sake. Amen.